to see you all here this morning um, and online. We're glad you're with us. A couple of announcements this morning. Um, worship volunteers, if you can stand up here and read the screen at the back, you can be the worship leader. You get the information ahead of time so you can review it at home, practice all the hard words and everything. Um, if you can hit buttons to advance the slides, you could sit at the back. There's no midweek practice. You just come on Sunday morning and you practice then. We also need folks to help put the um, streaming online. There's a very detailed instruction guide that will walk you through that, as well as folks willing to train you. And if you can keep a beat, we need you on drums. If you like to sing and can carry a tune, we'd love to have you up here in the band as well. Um, Bible study will meet this week at 10.30 and 6.45. The handball choir needs you. If you can count to four or six, <laughs> you can do that. You mark your music with colors, one color for left, one color for right. You can do that for sure. Um, the book club meets this week. Pub ministry meets this week. Um, the quilters meet on the second, fourth, and fifth. They're looking for more folks to join them at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's all that I have. Pastor, you have some? Good morning. Good morning. And on drums, Preston Hewitt. Yay! Preston, it's good to see you back. Welcome back from college for a little bit. Today's Christ the King Sunday. Uh, it celebrates the close of our liturgical church year uh, as we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is our chief allegiance, our highest allegiance in this life, uh, despite other allegiances which are claimed upon us. He is indeed our King. Also, uh, pledge cards. Uh, we ask, if you have filled them out, thank you so much in, already. If you have not, uh, could you do them today? Uh, we have some ground to make up. Uh, as we put together our proposed budget for next month. So if you could fill out a pledge card and leave it in the offering plate, the back table, that would be great. Also, since Christ the King Sunday closes out a liturgical year, that means we begin a new church year next Sunday with the season of Advent. So we look forward to seeing you all out next Sunday for the first season of Advent. Amen. <coughs> Please stand for our call to worship.
We come, for God gathers us here with that community called faith, where the hungry are served first, where the thirsty drink life's water. We come, for God welcomes us here into that home called grace, where the naked are clothed in robes of hope, where the stranger is embraced as the long-lost prodigal. We come, for God reunites us here, sisters and brothers in that family called love, where the imprisoned model justice, where the sick are cradled in God's peace. Amen. They are the promises stretching back into the dim recesses of time, yet as new as this very moment. When we lose our way, God searches for us until we are found. When we hurt others, God brings healing to all. When we sin, God forgives us. Let us hold these promises close to our hearts as we confess those things we try to hide. We stock the food pantries but brush, brush aside, aside those who hunger for friendship. We give our hand-me-downs away, but, but overlook those whose hopes have been stripped away. We, we glad-hand those just like us, but, but turn a deaf, deaf ear to our neighbors who talk funny. funny. Forgive, Forgive us, us, hope of the ages, you, you persistently search for us in the side streets of the world, gathering us up and bringing us home so we may be drenched in the waters of your bottomless pool of forgiveness, watched over by your child, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. As God calls us together in community, we look to God for guidance, forgiveness, and love. As God calls us together as a community, we look to each other for companionship, forgiveness, and love. Let us pass the peace of God. Yes. Okay, that will work. I was wondering why it didn't match what I was reading here on the paper. That happens sometimes. God searches for the lost and finds us. God invites the hungry to the table and feeds us. God sends Jesus and frees us from death's prison. God forgives all who sin and heals us with God's grace and mercy. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. As God calls us together in community, we look to God for guidance, forgiveness, and love. As God calls us together as a community, we look to each other for companionship, forgiveness, and love. Let us pass the peace of God and greet each other in community. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you.
cracked life from our mistakes black skies of my regrets outshone by this kindness new life dawns over my soul oh your cross it changes everything there my world begins anew with you oh your cross it's where my hope restarts Our reading today comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew. Where the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of this glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say, to those at his right hand. Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that I, we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will say, answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accused, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not, not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, <coughs> almighty and eternal Lord, we give you thanks for this day, which you have blessed us with for the beauty of your fall creation. We thank you for life, health, and strength, family, friends, and loved ones, food, clothing, and shelter. Especially on this week of Thanksgiving, we thank you uh, so much for who you are and all that you do for us, all the ways you provide for us and protect us. <clears throat> we come into your house this day uh, seeking a word. Uh, of healing, of hope, of compassion, a word of justice uh, for this world and for our hearts and our lives. Uh, we ask that you would bless us with that word now, that you would challenge us and convict us and then liberate us and set us free. Uh, as your word goes forth, we pray that it might be for the salvation of souls, the transformation of lives, the edification of all hearers, the furtherance of your kingdom and ultimately the glory of your name. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
<clears throat> my sermon text for this Christ the King Sunday is the gospel lesson, which is assigned for today, namely Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. My sermon title for today is a phrase or a question that is found four times within the text. Verses 37, 38, 39, and 44. My sermon title for today is When Was It? When Was It? Christ the King Sunday always ends the liturgical Christian year by celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ is our true King as Christians. And the kingdom of God is our chief concern, our true allegiance, and where our ultimate citizenship resides. In the second article of both the Apostles and the Nicene Creeds, which are our basic standards of faith, the last thing we confess concerning Jesus is that he will come to judge the living and the dead. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We belong then most fundamentally to a kingdom far greater than our national and political identity as Americans with our cherished values of democracy and capitalism. We belong to a sovereign and a judge far more superior than anyone we will ever elect or appoint. This morning's text is challenging, fascinating, provocative. It comes in the fifth great discourse or teaching of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, encompassing chapters 24 and 25, and concerning the end of time, the end of this age. Within that teaching, it is the fifth, final, and grand concluding parable, each of which advocates watchfulness and vigilance, wisdom and justice, as together we all approach the end. Jesus himself in the narrative is approaching his own end, as it were, as these are the very last words upon his lips before his own passion account begins. The very next verse says here, right outside the text we just read, forebodingly, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Today's text, known as the Great Judgment, is unique to Matthew's gospel. It has, interestingly enough, no parallel text in the other gospel accounts of Mark, Luke, or John. It carries both great weight and provocation for a couple of reasons, chief of which is that it seems to belie, on the face of things, a key Christian doctrine concerning salvation. The vast bulk of the New Testament teaches that you and I are saved by grace through faith apart from any works of the law. Ephesians, for example, famously sums up, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of your works, lest any of you should boast. Romans similarly declares, For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are justified now by his grace as a gift to be received by faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That is anything you do or don't do. Much of this thought from the Apostle Paul, actually the author of those letters, follows upon John's gospel. Uh, wherein the deciding factor is belief or faith in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, and you know this, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the weight and the bulk of the New Testament and traditional Christian teaching, and rightly so, I might add, is that you are saved by belief or faith in Jesus and by God's grace quite independently of anything you have done or not done. It is an utterly free gift of God based on God's goodness and God's initiative. And yet here, the only place in Scripture where Jesus himself teaches on heaven and hell and who goes where and why at the final judgment at the end of time, nothing is said about belief in him or grace or faith or free gift, but it's all based on what you do or don't do. And then to top it off, what you do or don't do has nothing to do with what we would call personal holiness or morality or righteousness. 
you know, the age-old categories of whether or not someone smokes, drinks, cusses, fornicates, listens to godless secular music, speaks in tongues, or even is a regular churchgoer for that matter. It is rather entirely based and solely based on how one treats others. Now, don't get it twisted, as they say. It all fits together as you study, reflect, and pray. God's free grace and belief in Jesus eventually issues forth in a life of compassion for others, and personal morality certainly has its place. But today's teaching from Jesus is critical, essential, provocative, a cautious and corrective reminder, and bears substantive reflection. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, Jesus declares in the opening three verses, and all the angels with Him in the opening three verses, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at His left This type of apocalyptic separation was alluded to earlier in Jesus' parables back in Matthew chapter 13 where a separation is made between the wheat and the weeds. The former are gathered, the latter are burned. And the good fish and the bad fish caught together in a big fishing net, the former put in baskets and the latter thrown out. For then the king will say to those who sit at his right hand, verse 34 says, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Here we do see grace actually, meaning unmerited or undeserved favor, because the word inherit means that you, it refers to something that you didn't earn, work for, or merit. An inheritance is a gift actually earned by someone else. So if you're among the sheep, you receive an inheritance, a gift, something you didn't fundamentally earn, and that is the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly enough, prepared for the sheep from the foundation of the world. Then comes the litany of good works or righteous deeds in which the sheep have walked. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, And you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was imprisoned and you visited me. Notice herein, if you will, a couple of things. First, God's special concern for those who are poor and needy. This is echoed actually in our first lesson assigned for today from the prophet Ezekiel where God declares that he himself will begin to shepherd his people. And I quote, I, God, will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Secondly, No mention is made in verses 35 and 36 of whether or not these particular folks of need deserved their plight. It doesn't say, in other words, whether they were lazy, shiftless people who somehow merited their misery or whether they were diligent, industrious folks who happened to fall through the cracks and therefore are more deserving of sympathy. There is nowhere here communicated any correlation between personal worth and societal or life outcome. And thirdly, lest you despair of inadequacy, nothing is said either of the amount or quantity of your response in the text. It doesn't say whether you provided a nine-course meal or a few McNuggets. It doesn't say whether you gave a bottle of Mondavi wine or simply a cup of cold water whether you healed them of cancer or simply put a cold wash rag on their feverish, heated forehead. You simply saw a need and responded, heard a cry and heeded it, discovered a lack and made provision. Another fascinating and jarring aspect of this text is the reaction of these two groups, the sheep and the goats, to the king's pronouncement. Verse 37 Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? Somebody say, when was it? 
that we saw you hungry and gave you food, thirsty and gave you drink, a stranger and welcomed you, naked and clothed you, sick or in prison and visited you. They say it three times here in three verses. When was it that we did that? When was it that we did that? When was it that we did that? I love this reaction because those who are sheep aren't even aware of it. Those who are righteous are oblivious. Those who provide do so reflexively without even thinking about it. Those who are going to heaven here in this scenario don't even know it. Seem to be surprised by the fact. Really? When was it? When did I do that? I don't even recall. Now, when you look at the other side, there's a glaring disparity on a couple of levels. Then he will say to those at his left hand, verse 40, 41 reports, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? The opposite of the above litany. I was hungry and you gave me no food. Thirsty and you gave me no drink. A stranger you did not welcome me. Naked you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And what's their response? Verse 44, then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison and did not take care of you? When did we not do it, Lord? One way of reading this, my friends, is that the goats are seemingly as shocked as the sheep, but for the opposite reason. They seem to think that they are doing these things and are therefore seemingly indignant that it's even being brought up at all or questioned. Psh, when did we not do that? The sheep and the goats are both unawares. The righteous ask, when did we do these things? While the unrighteous ask, when did we not? Those at the king's right hand are genuinely shocked and pleasantly surprised, while those at his left come across as defensive, smug, and offended. In short, with this parable anyway, those who are going to heaven don't realize it, and those who think they are apparently aren't. It's another one of Jesus' jarring role reversals. Similar to when he said, sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of heaven before priests and religious leaders. Here once again in this scripture, the gospel serves to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The gospel serves to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. The pearl of criterion here is the justifiably memorable verses 40 and 45. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. And truly I tell you in verse 45, just as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. First off, what group here is the desired object of Jesus' concern and our compassion and service? The least of these, the last, lost, lonely, broken, forgotten, and forsaken, the hurting and grieving and vulnerable, those taunted, scorned, or mocked, the last person picked on the playground. Historically speaking, those without power or voice, the marginalized, women, Black and brown people, immigrants and refugees, the LGBTQ community, those incarcerated, and those disabled or differently abled. What number in that group does Jesus mention here? One. One of the least of these. You don't have to save the world, my friends. Save one. You don't have to feed the world. Feed one. You can't protect everyone. Protect one. 
And finally, notice that Jesus doesn't liken himself to the least of these as much as equate himself to them. As you have done to them, you have done to me. As you have not done to them, you have not done to me. When we bless our sisters and brothers in need, we bless Jesus. When we ignore, dismiss, or hurt them, we ignore, dismiss, or hurt Jesus. The concluding verse, number 46, and these goats will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous sheep into eternal life. Towards the end of his Sermon on the Mount, back in chapter 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Which begs the question, so what is his will? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? When did we not do it, Lord? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. There are three levels of increasing reaction to God's word as I read it in the Bible. Number one, King Herod Antipas has imprisoned John the Baptist, you may recall, whom he will eventually put to death by having him beheaded. It says, Herod heard John. He was much perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. He heard him. He was much perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. That's stage one. You hear God's word. You are perplexed, don't quite understand it yet, and yet you hear it gladly. You're intrigued, interested, curious. That's a King Herod reaction. And number two, after Jesus is resurrected on the original Easter, he travels with two of his disciples, one of them named Cleopas, on the road to Emmaus, but they don't recognize him. Only later does he reveal himself to them in their supper together, after which the disciples will say, Did not our hearts burn within us as he Talk to us and open the scriptures to us on the road. Herein, you hear the word, your heart burns within you, but you don't yet see Christ for who he is. That's a Cleopas reaction. And number three, in the book of James, it enjoins us, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. For a hearer forgets, but a doer acts, and he shall be blessed in his doing. He shall be blessed in his doing. That's a James reaction. You are blessed when you feed the hungry. You are blessed giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, welcoming the stranger, visiting the sick and in prison. They might be filled, but you are blessed. They might be embraced and warmed and comforted, but you are the one who is blessed. And the more blessed you become, my friends, the more you go from King Herod to Cleopas to James, from perplexed to your heart burning to a doer who acts, the more sheep-like you become. You become so reflexive in your loving, so spontaneous in your giving, so natural in your serving, so unthinking in your generosity, so tireless in your ministry, so joyful in your compassion and your provision, so unstinting in your self-emptying, so indefatigable in your discipleship. The next thing you know, you look up and say, was that me? When did I do that? How much did I give away again? To how many people? When was it that I did that? When was it again? When was it? Indeed. Amen. Support of our ministries to share the love of Christ is much appreciated. You can go to stphilip.org, mail it, or leave it in the plate at the back. Thank you. Yeah. 
Please stand. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together let us pray as Jesus asks us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the distribution. All are invited to, all are welcome at the Lord's table. Uh, we have a gluten-free option available for you. If that is your preference, please let me know as you approach. Uh, small children are invited forward for a blessing. We commune by method of intinction, which simply means you take the bread, dip it into the chalice, and place it in your mouth. The dark liquid in the chalice is wine. The uh, light liquid is grape juice. After we commune the worship and praise band, we'll ask you to form a single file line down the center aisle to come and receive the body and blood of Christ for the remission of all your sins and the conferral of eternal life.
Please rise and receive our post-communal blessing. And now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us as one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Siblings in Christ, what is our purpose? Jesus asked that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Jesus tells us that a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. We answer that call and we go out to share the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
It is not enough to acclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and King. Our mission in life is to make his kingdom a reality among us and to bring it to those around us by our words and deeds. The way to do this is to live as Jesus lived, for others, in love and service. May Almighty God bless you for the task. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and to give shape to his kingdom. Thanks be to God. God.